Okay, in this first video on cardiovascular physiology, we'll review um, some of the basics of um, how cardiac myocytes uh, function. Uh, we'll look at the different ion gradients across the myocyte, um, the different electrical activity that they're capable of conducting. And then we'll look at something called the cardiac action potential. And then uh, we'll delve into how the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems uh, can regulate the heart rate. And finally, we'll end with the discussion of the electrocardiogram, including the 12-lead the, uh, uh, ECG. So to understand the physiology of the heart, we have to really look at the uh, blood flow through the heart, uh, the structure of cardiac muscle, uh, the electrical conduction system through the heart, uh, something called the cardiac cycle, and then uh, finally uh, the concept of cardiac output. So we need to look at all these different features. Um, so we can think of the blood flow really as uh, the heart is a sort of a double pump. Uh, the left and the right heart uh, beat in unison. So both ventricles contract at the same time. And remember the contraction is known as systole and the relaxation of the uh, muscles is known as diastole. Now the atria also contract, but we are usually interested more in the ventricles. So when we say systole, we're talking about ventricular contraction and diastole ventricular relaxation. Um, there's really two circuits in circulation. I, we talked about this earlier. There's a systemic circuit, which involves systemic circulation, the blood going into the aorta, and then out through all the arteries. Um, and that is driven by the left heart and the left ventricle. And so the left ventricle requires a very thick wall. It has to maintain that systemic uh, blood pressure. Uh, then of course, there's a pulmonary circuit driven by the right heart. So uh, this has a much lower <clears throat> blood pressure. Remember the average is about 10 millimeters of mercury. Uh, typically in the pulmonary circuit. So the right ventricle is a lot thinner uh, and less muscular than the left ventricle. The cardiac cycle is the period of time that begins with the contraction of the atria and ends with ventricular relaxation. So systole is the contraction phase <clears throat> and um, both atria and, vent and ventricles undergo systole. But again, when we usually talk about systole, we're talking about the ventricles and then diastole, same thing. So uh, that's one uh, cardiac cycle. And uh, by the end of the physiology lectures, we'll be able to integrate the cardiac cycle with the blood flow, with what the valves are doing at the different parts of the cardiac cycle, what the electrical activity uh, is, uh, what's occurring at the different parts of the cardiac cycle, how we can look at that on the EKG, and then finally how that correlates with the heart sound. So that'll be the sort of overall goal we're working towards. So remember the body has three types of muscle. There's uh, skeletal muscle, which is your voluntary muscle. There's smooth muscle, which is regulated by your autonomic nervous system. And that regulates uh, the tone on a lot of your, you know, the intestines and the bile ducts and uh, bladder and so forth. And then there is the, the cardiac muscle and the cells, the muscle cells uh, of cardiac muscle are called myocytes. Uh, these are permanent cells. That means that they don't have the capacity to regenerate. Um, unlike some smooth muscle can regenerate, uh, skeletal muscle is the same way. It has a pretty limited capacity of regeneration. So if you damage a big portion of muscles in your thigh, for example, uh, they will not uh, repair. They'll be replaced with scar tissue. Um, same thing with the heart muscle, which is why uh, heart muscle you know, undergoing infarction or death of the cells um, that area will be replaced by scar tissue and that will result in a loss of cardiac function. Um, there is some evidence that there are cardiac stem cells and if given the right kind of environment uh, and the right signals, they can actually uh, grow and repair damaged cardiac tissue. So there's an interest looking at, for example, stem cell injections into areas of the heart muscle that have been damaged by infarction, uh, but that's still all very uh, experimental. Um, just to review so that we understand how the cardiac muscle works, we need to review first uh, how skeletal muscle works in contraction. Um, so again, in skeletal muscle, there are individual muscle cells, um, and the muscle cells are composed of these uh, long bands of uh, protein. Um, the two major muscle proteins are actin and myosin. And actin and myosin, when they <clears throat> bind to each other, they, they cause this sort of contraction cycle, and that's going to shorten the muscle fiber, and that will result in muscle contraction. Um, and um, what the signal for initiating that is going to actually occur through the nervous system. 
So in skeletal muscle, we need a, a neuron coming in, a nerve essentially, that sends projections into the muscle cells and um, uh, action potentials that travel down the, uh, the neuron will reach the <clears throat> muscle cell and they'll cause a depolarization in the membrane of the muscle cell. So essentially this is gonna cause um, voltage gated ion channels to open. Um, these are sodium channels and that's gonna cause the membrane to depolarize. Remember at rest, um, all cells have what's called a resting membrane potential. And so um, uh, in the case of skeletal muscle cells, they have a slight negative charge on the inside and a positive charge on the outside at rest. That's the resting membrane potential. But what's gonna happen <clears throat> when the uh, nerve activates the muscle, um, the main neurotransmitter, by the way, remember is acetylcholine. And so when acetylcholine binds to its receptor on the muscle cell, that's gonna cause sodium ions to actually rush into the cell. And um, as a result, the inside of the membrane becomes a little bit more positive um, than it was at rest, and that is going to cause it to depolarize. Once that happens, it's going to open up channels for calcium, and the calcium will rush into the cell. That will also trigger calcium, which is stored in a special organelle inside the cell called the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium. And when calcium is released inside the muscle cell, it causes the um, the uh, actin and myosin essentially to bind together. So <clears throat> if we look at those muscle filaments more closely, they're really composed of what's called a thick filament, and uh, this is the uh, myosin, and then a thin filament, which is actin, together with a couple other proteins, and I don't want to um, belabor this too long, but basically there's a protein called troponin and another one called tropomyosin. So we have the thin filaments, which are actin plus troponin plus tropomyosin, um, and then we have the thick filaments. So to have a muscle contract, the thin filament's going to have to connect with the thick filament. At rest, that is prevented from happening by the fact that troponin and tropomyosin block the site on the uh, actin. Uh, with which myosin combines. So normally myosin has these little feet that stick out and it can bind to the actin, but normally those binding sites are blocked by troponin and tropomyosin. When the calcium comes into the cell and it's released into the cytoplasm, it's gonna move the troponin and tropomyosin away um, and that will allow the myosin to bind to actin and that will allow the muscle to contract. So calcium really is the uh, primary electrolyte that's needed inside the cell to uh, let, uh, allow the myosin and the actin to bind together. And that's all going to be stimulated, triggered by the release of acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction here uh, where the neuron meets the muscle cell. So in skeletal muscle, essentially we need the nerve input to initiate depolarization and then inside the cell, calcium is going to allow the troponin and tropomyosin to bind and to contract uh, past one another. Um, and the way it works in skeletal muscle is that the more of these muscle fibers, these muscle cells that are recruited, the stronger the contraction uh, that occurs. So the nervous system really can regulate how many of those fibers are recruited. Um, as we'll see in the case of cardiac muscle, this is very different. Cardiac muscle actually does not need a nerve to stimulate the cell to depolarize. In fact, it's self-depolarizing. And that's what gives some of the areas of the heart muscle, like the SA node and the AV node we discussed in the last videos, to spontaneously depolarize, and it creates what's called a pacemaker potential. So we'll look at that coming up here. But that'll be the difference. But understanding skeletal muscle contraction is kind of the first step in understanding this. So cardiac myocytes are going to have the capacity to contract like any other muscle, smooth or skeletal muscle, uh, but they have a very different structure than uh, skeletal or smooth muscle. They are striated like skeletal muscle. In fact, the striations are formed by those um, long uh, proteins of actin and myosin inside the cell. So there's actin and myosin, uh, so that's striation. Um, and then there are, so that's composed of the thick and the thin filaments. And so inside cardiac my, uh, myocytes, we have myosin, we have uh, actin, we have troponin and tropomyosin. Um, now the troponins in, card in uh, cardiac myocytes are different than skeletal muscles. So we have two troponins, cardiac troponin I, um, and cardiac troponin T. Now, why these are important is that if 
cardiac muscle is damaged, then this can happen in infarction, like an MI, myocardial infarction, the troponins will spill into the blood and they can be used as biomarkers for muscle cell uh, death. And uh, they're gonna appear within three hours in the blood after an MI, a heart attack. Uh, and they can be used to actually diagnose that you're actually having a heart attack. So patients with chest pain, when they present to the emergency room, First, they're going to get uh, an EKG, and then they're going to get a blood test to actually measure the cardiac troponins. And if they're elevated, uh, that indicates there is actual heart muscle death occurring. And so that's a hallmark of a heart attack. Uh, the levels peak within 10 to 24 hours, but then they stay around for a couple of days. Um, as we'll see, there are other muscle enzymes that are measured as well, but they're not specific so much to the heart when we look for biomarkers for myocardial infarction. Um, there are some new tests that are actually measuring their, it's called high sensitivity troponins, um, that uh, in the setting of like heart failure and whatnot, we're always leaking a little bit of tr cardiac troponins into the blood. And the more elevated those troponins are, the more uh, potential damage and injury there is to heart muscle. So the high sensitivity cardiac troponins are being used now not to diagnose uh, MI, um, but to, to diagnose more subtle uh, changes in cardiac metabolism. So you might see those tests out there. Um, there is, there are a couple of con uh, cardiac conditions. One is called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Cardiomyopathy are basically uh, diseases of the heart muscle that are not due to, for example, blockage of the coronary arteries or something like that. Uh, and one of the different types of cardiomyopathy, there's several different types, it's called hypertrophic. Um, it's actually the leading cause of sudden cardiac death in athletes. So you hear the stories of, you know, a very uh, in shape athlete, you know, basketball player or football player or something that suddenly dies during practice or something like this. Uh, often the cause is uh, they had an undiagnosed uh, cardiomyopathy uh, that led to usually a fatal arrhythmia during uh, exercise. Um, and what happens in the hypertrophic is that the uh, myocytes actually enlarge. And this is uh, due to genetic mutations in uh, some of the proteins that code for some of the, uh, uh, some of the genes actually, they code for the proteins that are part of the muscle unit, uh, the so-called sarcomere. Um, so that's one uh, potential cardiac condition. And we'll see there's a number of different cardiomyopathies. And, uh, the so-called primary cardiomyopathies are due to genetic problems in some of those uh, genes, again, that are coding for muscle proteins. Uh, so that's the first thing. So cardiac muscle is striated, like skeletal muscle. Remember, smooth muscle is not striated, so you don't see these striations. The actin and the myosin are more diffusely scattered throughout the cytoplasm, so they don't have this kind of regular structure. Um, just to, I should say, in terms of the striations, one other concept we need to know here um, that's the same for skeletal muscle, is that we have a unit. So uh, if you kind of look at the striations and zoom in on them, so this is looking inside of a cardiac muscle, uh, a myocyte. Um, this sort of cluster here represents a large band of proteins, uh, the actin and the myosin, troponin and tropomyosin, that are all aligned together. Um, and if you look at them, they uh, have different colors at different portions. And these are seen with an electron microscope. They're gonna appear differently. Um, and what we find is that there is what we call the Z-disc uh, at one end, Z-disc is at another. And then in the middle, we have the thick filaments. Those are in dark red here. These are the myosin filaments. And then in between, we have the thin actin filaments. So almost like uh, you know, rungs sort of like a comb, they're sort of fit together. Uh, this unit is called the sarcomere. So the sarcomere is um, the uh, muscle unit here. And what's gonna happen with contraction is that again, the actin and the myosin are gonna join together and they're gonna slide past each other and it's gonna shorten the sarcomere. And that's what's gonna result in the muscle contraction. Uh, notice in the myocyte too, there is what's called the um, sarcoplasm, sarcoplasmic reticulum. So this is a variant of the endoplasmic reticulum. Um, and in this case, it stores up calcium. So remember, calcium is going to be the important uh, ion that's going to be needed to initiate uh, muscle contraction. And then there are these little uh, indentations from the surface called T-tubules that are going to allow electrolytes from outside the cardiac muscle cell to enter into the muscle cell. 
Um, and there's different divisions of the sarcomere. Um, there's what's called the I band, the A band, and so forth. I won't go into that here. Um, another feature of the muscle, uh, any muscle cell, um, is that it's very rich in mitochondria. So both skeletal and cardiac muscle have a lot of mitochondria. These make, of course, ATP. And uh, ATP is actually needed not to help the muscle contract, but once the actin and myosin have bound together, uh, the cell has to generate ATP, which then binds to the actin myosin and causes them to detach. So to get a muscle to relax, you need to make ATP. And that requires oxygen that comes in. And so the oxygen is being brought into the muscle cell, uh, remember, by the coronary arteries. So the coronary arteries will supply oxygen to the heart muscle. And the mitochondria will take that oxygen, will take um, you know substrates, uh, pyruvate, and so forth, and will make it into uh, ATP. It will also make it into heat. So the uh, muscle cells, cardiac and skeletal muscle, are the primary tissues that actually generate heat in the body. So the heart muscle actually is loaded with mitochondria, makes a lot of heat. Um, in mitochondria, we haven't discussed them in depth, but um, one of the important uh, sort of compounds, molecules in mitochondria that allow electrons to be transferred in what's part, it's called the electron transport chain to make ATP is a molecule called coenzyme Q10 or CoQ10. Um, and so any tissue that has a lot of mitochondria is going to need a lots of CoQ10. Now the body can synthesize CoQ10, but some argue there are conditions when we actually uh, need extra CoQ10 dietarily. Um, and uh, CoQ10 is going to be very important for helping the mitochondria make adequate levels of ATP. So you might see people supplementing CoQ10 for cardiac conditions, and that's why. That's essentially giving the heart muscle more energy um, and a uh, very important uh, substrate for that. Um, unfortunately, one of the major medications out there for regulating cholesterol, the so-called statin drugs, uh, like Lipitor and so forth, uh, statin drugs will... Uh, they work by inhibiting the enzyme in the liver, which synthesizes cholesterol. Um, so they work by decreasing cholesterol. But they also uh, work uh, the same pathways, make CoQ10. So unfortunately, the, the statins also decrease CoQ10. So one of the uh, adverse effects of statin drugs is uh, some degree of, in skeletal muscle, myopathy, uh, muscle uh, usually muscle aching, pain. It could even go into muscle inflammation. It's called myositis. And it rarely can even cause the muscle to rupture and completely uh, dissolve. That's called rhabdomyolysis. Um, so this is kind of a problem, kind of a conundrum. The cholesterol we know is a major risk factor, and we'll talk about this later, for uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, for causing plaques and whatnot in the coronary arteries. Um, so we try to reduce that as a risk factor. Unfortunately, it also causes potential injury to the heart muscle itself. So there is a bit of a double-edged sword there. Uh, so we'll come back to talk about that. But CoQ10 is one of the very important nutrients for proper mitochondrial function. Um, okay, so that's the striations and the actin and the myosin, troponin, uh, tropomyosin within the cardiac myocytes. Uh, another unique feature of cardiac myocytes is that uh, unlike skeletal muscle where all the cells are kind of ranged parallel to one another, uh, they have more of a branch-like structure. So you can see that in the picture up here. Um, here's one muscle cell, and then um, here, and then here is another muscle cell. And so they're not next, next to one another, but they're sort of branched. Um, so that's another uh, unique feature. Um, they also have, again, um, this is typical also of skeletal muscle, but they have these uh, invaginations of the sarcolemma. The sarcolemma is the plasma membrane around the muscle cell. Um, it's the cell membrane of the myocyte. Um, the T tubules are invaginations. So this is the cell membrane uh, that goes around like this. Uh, these are deep invaginations, and they're going to allow, again, uh, ions like sodium and whatnot to easily enter uh, inside the muscle, uh, in, inside the cell. And then those electrolytes will cause changes, like causing calcium to be released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the cytoplasm, and that will trigger muscle contraction. Uh, but in myocytes, the T-tubules are larger. Um, there are fewer as well, uh, and they track laterally to the Z-discs. So if you look at this picture down here, here is uh, 
one of those um, sarcomeres, one of those contractile units of the muscle. Here's the sarcolemma, the plasma membrane of the cardiac myocyte. And uh, here is a T tubule. So see how deeply it goes. This is the so-called Z disc right here. And so this is important because this is going to allow ions to come right in and it's going to allow them to essentially interact with the sarcoplasmic reticulum, uh, which is in blue here. And this stores calcium. So this is whatever happens in the T-tubules can cause a, a massive release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and that'll cause contraction of the actin in the myosin. Um, so that's one difference between skeletal muscle in that the T-tubules track the Z-discs. Um, finally, uh, myocytes have what are called intercalated discs. So they're joined by these little discs, and you can see them up in this picture here, the little squiggly line. The intercalated disc um, joins two cells together, and they have uh, basically these gaps called uh, gap junctions. Um, and these are going to allow ions, so you can see that in the picture up here, allow ions to flow from one cell to another. So this is going to allow rapid ion exchange between cells, so it doesn't have to happen outside the cell. And so again, this gives the cardiac muscle a property of acting as uh, not just a single uh, cell, but a large you know, group of cells can all act in unison, basically. So that is known as a syntitium. And so cardiac muscle cell forms the cardiac syntitium. So muscle cells contract as a unit, kind of an, an all or nothing phenomenon. Um, the, uh, the intercalated discs really have three types of cell junctions. So we have what are called the adherence junctions, and these are via actin filaments that travel across. There are desmosomes. <clears throat> there are the gap junctions I just talked about. Remember, gap junctions really are just ion channels. Um, they're kind of like rivets with a hole in the middle, and so that allows ions to go through. And then there are mixed areas of adherence junctions and desmosomes. Um, going back to some of the cardiomyopathies I talked about, the inherent diseases of the heart muscle, um, these can also involve genetic problems of the genes that code for the different proteins that uh, comprise the different junctions. So that's uh, another potential cause of cardiomyopathy. Okay, so that's some of the unique features of cardiac myocytes. Now, I mentioned this before, but remember that all cells at rest have a so-called resting membrane potential. And so if you were to stick a voltmeter uh, with one probe on the inside of the cell membrane and the other probe on the outside of the cell membrane, you'd see a slight negative charge. And most cells are somewhere around minus 70, uh, minus 80, minus 90 millivolts. Cardiac uh, muscle cells are around minus 90 millivolts at rest. Um, and that's maintained by several things. Number one, the sodium potassium ATPase pump. So that requires uh, ATP as an energy source. Uh, the extracellular concentrations of potassium and sodium. So we, uh, muscle cells, like all of the cells, keep more sodium on the outside, more potassium relatively on the inside, and then the sodium-potassium ATPs keeps pumping out three sodium ions for, uh, and it brings in two potassium ions. But the net effect is to create a slight negative charge on the inside of the membrane. Um, now that's at rest and uh, at, a, at resting cells. Some cells, like neurons, which we've already looked at in the neurology block, but skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle and smooth muscle can also undergo uh, an action potential. And that is a short acting event in which the resting membrane potential uh, at a region of the membrane will rapidly change. So usually we talk about depolarization again when the resting membrane potential goes a little bit more positive on the inside uh, and then hyperpolarization when it goes a little bit more negative on the inside. Um, so that's going to be maintained by very special channels. So these special types of cells have uh, what are called voltage-gated ion channels and that's going to allow them to create action potentials. Um, Unlike neurons and skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle does not need, though, a nerve signal to initiate the action potential. Uh, the cardiac muscles are unique in that they can initiate their own action potentials. Um, down here is a picture of an action potential in neurons, which again is a review, um, and we summarize it in the kind of graph to the left here. So this is time along the horizontal axis. 
and then membrane potential along the top. So neurons typically at rest are at minus 70 millivolts. Uh, the opening of voltage-gated sodium channels is going to cause sodium to rush in. That's going to depolarize the membrane. And once it gets to that magical threshold uh, number, it will cause a rapid opening of these sodium channels, a rapid influx of sodium, and that will cause the membrane to depolarize, going up all the way to positive 30 uh, millivolts. So more positive on the inside than the outside of the neuron. And then eventually potassium channels, voltage-gated potassium channels open, and they're going to um, allow uh, basically potassium to come into the cell. And uh, that is going to restore the action potential, uh, uh, go back to the resting memory potential. It'll actually go a little more negative, and then eventually the sodium-potassium ATPase will let everything equilibrate, and that will bring it back to the resting memory potential. So this would be in one little portion of membrane, the voltage changes found in that place. As we'll see with cardiac action potentials, um, that is going to um, uh, happen spontaneously because of very specific ion channels that are found in the cell membrane of the cardiac myocytes. So cardiac myocytes uh, exhibit a couple of really unique properties. One is called automaticity. So again, they can generate their own action potentials without the need for any chemical or electrical stimulus uh, from another source. Um, and that uh, signal can spread uh, the impulse from cell to cell, again, via those intercalated discs, and that can trigger contraction of the entire heart. Um, now, so the heart has its own innate automaticity that can be modulated by your sympathetic parasympathetic nervous system and different hormones. So we'll look at those inputs. But basically, we can speed up or slow down the automaticity of the different sets of cells in the cardiac muscle. Um, again, we don't need a neuron, though, to initiate the, the action potential. So if we look at the uh, heart, picture of the heart over here, we see the SA node. Um, at rest, on its own, no other input, it beats somewhere between 60 and 100 beats per minute. So that's the typical firing rate of the SA node. And there's different genetic reasons and whatnot why it's different in different people. Um, but basically, everyone's SA node normally fires between 60 and 100 beats per minute. Then that signal is going to spread through the atria down specialized myocytes that are going to allow the electrical signal to, to spread through. And as it spreads down through those cells, it's going to cause all the neighboring cells, um, I'll draw it in the marker in the red, all these neighboring cells now are going to, draw in blue, uh, are going to contract. So as that signal spreads through, it's going to cause the muscle to contract. So the atria are going to contract first. Then the electrical signal is going to gather, and it's going to collect at the AV node here. Um, and then the AV node will pass, will actually slow the signal down and pass it down to the bundle of Hiss. And then through what are called the bundle branches, there's a left and a right bundle branch. And then down to the apex of the heart here, it's going to uh, go up the so-called Purkinje fibers, uh, up the sides of the ventricular walls, and it's going to cause the ventricles to basically contract as this signal goes down. It's going to cause all these tissues to contract at the same time, so up the ventricular wall. So the if you look at the ventricles, they start contracting down here, and then the contraction spreads upward uh, to either side. And that's going to effectively push blood out through the aortic valve, oops, uh, through the aortic valve and through the pulmonary valve to the lungs. Um, so if you look at these different areas of heart muscles, they have their intrinsic automaticity rates. So the SA node, again, beats between 60 and 100 beats per minute. Atrial cells, many of them on their own, are capable of automaticity. So one of the unique features of how the electrical signals are conducted and spread and so forth is that cardiac muscle cells are entrained essentially to the fastest um, sort of uh, uh, firing rate uh, of cells. So if you look at the SA node, it's going to overpower other potential pacemakers in the heart. So any of these areas in the heart can become a pacemaker, uh, but usually the SA node will silence them uh, because it's beating at the fastest rate and it's causing the cells to synchronize with its rate. But if the SA node were to go offline, let's say you had a heart attack, 
you had a blockage of the right coronary artery. Remember that feeds the SA node. SA node cells die. Well, now um, some of the atrial cells on their own can start pacing, and they can become like a secondary pacemaker. Unfortunately, in the case of atrial cells, if one over here starts firing, the signal is going to spread very erratically through the atria. Um, it'll get to the, S, the, the AV node, it may spread down to the ventricles, but it's going to be a very erratic signal. And if you have a couple of groups of atrial cells all firing on their own, then you're going to have a very erratic uh, contraction in the atria. In fact, we'll see that's associated with what we call atrial fibrillation uh, and different uh, what are called supraventricular tachycardias. Uh, that can cause very rapid heart rate. So we'll look at that later. But atrial cells can, on their own, become pacemakers. The AV node itself can become a pacemaker. It beats typically at 45 to 50 beats per minute. The bundle of Hiss also beats around the same uh, time, uh, rate. Uh, and then the Purkinje fibers, uh, actually the bundle branches, can also pace um, the heart. And the Purkinje fibers can, um, can also set, can uh, undergo automaticity and set their own rate. And then the ventricular myocardium can actually pay somewhere between 20 and 30 uh, beats per minute. So um, each area of the cell could, on its own, pace the whole heart. Unfortunately, when you get down to 20, 30, 35 beats per minute, that's often not enough to maintain normal cardiac output. We're going to see a drop in the amount of blood coming out of the heart, and that will result in a lot of... Uh, potentially severe, even uh, fatal symptoms. Um, so not all these pacemakers are adequate necessarily for maintaining normal cardiac output. But that's an interesting phenomena that the heart will, um, can be entrained by its fastest pacemaker. But typically under normal conditions, if the SA node um, paces everything, then the AV node takes that signal, passes it down, and so forth. Uh, so when we look at arrhythmias, we'll see how these different regions on their own can start pacing the heart. Um, okay, so that's one feature is automaticity. The other is rhythmicity, and that is the ability to generate uh, potentials in a rapid or a regular repetitive manner. So basically, if you look at the SA and the AV node, they're like a little clock. They can spontaneously depolarize at a regular rhythmic rate, and that's why we call them pacemakers. So if we look at the heart in general, we really find two different types of cardiomyocytes. Uh, um, we have the uh, pacemaker cells. I'll start with those that I just talked about. We call those conductive cardiomyocytes, and they're basically everything pictured in the picture up here. The well, I colored it all in, but all those conducting channels. Um, so, looking at the conducting channels in the atria, uh, through the bundle of Hiss, the uh, interventricular septum, the bundle branches, and then the ventricular wall. All of those would be formed from pacemaker cells. And uh, these are modified cardiomyocytes. They're smaller. They have few myofibrils, which are the actin myosin. So we have, they're not really involved in contraction. Um, and they're going to basically form a little conduction system in the heart. Um, their function similar to the neurons, but notice they are not neurons. So they're, they're different there. The majority of the heart muscle, though, are the actual uh, cardiomyocytes and we call those contractile or contractive cardiomyocytes. Um, they have lots of actinomyosin, they can contract easily, and they're gonna respond uh, to the action potentials from the pacemaker cells. So that'll be the difference here. Um, I'll look at, the, we'll show you this diagram in the next slide, but this is really a picture of the action potential of a pacemaker cell. Notice that at uh, rest, so minus 60, um, uh, millivolts on the inside of the membrane, um, there's actually an interesting channel in the conductive or the pacemaker cells that slowly allows sodium to trickle in. And uh, when it reaches a threshold potential, it'll initiate an action potential. And then it'll go back down to resting and then gradually go up to threshold and so forth. So if you just took the SA or the AV node cells out of the heart, put them in a Petri dish, they would on their own spontaneously undergo these depolarizations. Um, again, uh, one cardiac myocyte put next to another will entrain it, and the cardiac myocytes will entrain to the fastest uh, rhythm around it. So that's the phenomena of entrainment. Um, and that's how the SA node normally is becomes the primary pacemaker of the heart. So that's a little bit about the uh, types of myocytes and some of their electrical properties.
Now, this slide gets pretty technical here, but this basically is just talking about the two different types of action potentials we have in those different types of cardiac myocytes. Um, they uh, each differ in their shape and their conduction velocity. So let's talk about the contractile cells first. So these are the majority of the cardiac myocytes. Um, so we can think of, for example, the thick ventricular wall is mostly made of these contractile cells. Um, they have several different types of ion channels, including voltage-gated sodium channels. Um, they have what are called L-type voltage-gated calcium channels, um, also known as dihydropyridine channels. Well, that'll make sense when we talk about a class of drugs called calcium channel blockers. Uh, they're a major class of cardiac medication that can block the calcium channels, preventing the heart from contra over-contracting. Um, and then various potassium channels. So if you kind of look at the um, uh, contractile cells, at their action potential, it goes through five basic phases. So I'll just summarize them. You don't need to memorize all these. But um, basically, phase zero would be um, at rest. And that's going to, um, there could be a triggering event. So for, so for example, if there's an electrical signal passing through or the ionic signal passing through the conductive cell nearby, it's going to cause the opening of these voltage-gated sodium channels. And it's going to be a very rapid upsweep of the membrane potential just past zero millivolts. Um, then there's a little plateau phase, and then it's gonna fall back to resting. And the numbers here represent the different phases. So phase zero is the rapid upstroke and depolarization, and that's governed by the opening of voltage-gated sodium channels. Phase one is gonna be an initial repolarization, so notice it's dropping a little bit, um, and that's due to the voltage-gated sodium channels closing voltage-gated potassium channels opening, and then we're getting a little efflux of uh, potassium, and that's going to drop the membrane voltage a little bit back towards negative. Uh, phase two is this plateau phase here, and that's where now we get um, what are called L-type calcium channels opening, those dihydropyridine channels I talked about. And so calcium influx through those voltage-gated channels will balance the calcium efflux. So basically we're gonna get a little more positively charged calcium going into the cell. That's gonna delay the action potential um, a little bit. And then um, that's going to essentially allow the myocyte to contract. So all that calcium going into the cell will cause actin and myosin to bind together. So we can say this phase is gonna slow the action potential down a little bit, allow for proper contraction of the heart muscle. Um, Another important function of that plateau phase is it extends that depolarization and creates an absolute refractory period. So during the plateau phase, no other stimulus could cause that uh, cardiac myocyte to contract again. So that's important because it prevents cardiac tetany. So unlike skeletal muscle that can go into tetany, in other words, a permanent contraction, if it keeps getting stimulated by a nerve impulse, um, cardiac muscle can't undergo tetany, and that prevents it from seizing up, basically. Um, phase three would be the rapid repolarization, and that's governed by uh, closing of those voltage-gated calcium channels, and now potassium channels open, and calcium now, uh, potassium, sorry, leaves the cell, and that depolarizes it, and then we reach down to phase four, which is the resting potential, and uh, that's going to be maintained by the sodium potassium ATPase. So in a nutshell, the contractile cells go through five phases. They have a plateau phase governed by voltage-gated calcium channels that will, number one, allow the muscle cells to properly contract, but also prevent um, uh, tetany in the heart muscle. Um, now, the 1% of the remaining cells are those pacemaker or conducting cells. There's a lot of them up in the SA and the AV nodes. That's why those are your primary kind of pacemakers in the heart. Um, they're also found in the bundle of Hiss and the Purkinje fibers. Um, these are all self-depolarizing. So unlike the contractile cells, which need an outside uh, stimulus here, not a nerve stimulus, not a neuron stimulus, but another stimulus from a pacemaker cell, the pacemaker cells can undergo spontaneous depolarization. Uh, they have slightly different channels, so they have uh, both what are called L and T-type voltage-gated calcium channels. They also have a unique feature. They have what are called funny sodium channels, and these open before the action potential occurs. So uh, if you look at the phases of the uh, pacemaker cells, or what's known as a slow response action potential, um, 
the uh, it's a little simpler. There's only three phases. So phase zero is your upstroke, but notice it's not quite as rapid as in the contractile cell. Um, it's less steep. And this has to do with the uh, voltage gated calcium channels opening. So calcium is causing an influx and that's going to depolarize the cell. Um, the upstroke, again, a phase zero um, in the AV node is slower than in the myocytes. And that's going to be important because it's going to allow the ventricles uh, time. It's going to slow down the conduction through the AV node and it's going to allow the ventricles to fully fill with blood um, and to be prepared for the next contraction phase of the heart systole. Um, so again, pacemaker cells use calcium to depolarize versus the contractile myocytes use sodium. That's one important difference there. Uh, there's no phase one and two, so no plateau phase in the uh, pacemaker cells. Phase three would go right into repolarization here, and uh, that has to do with the closing of the voltage-gated calcium channels and then uh, opening of the potassium channels, just like we saw in the last one. Uh, and we get calcium leave, uh, potassium leaving the cell, and that depolarizes it. And then in phase four, we have the... Uh, that's depicted in this diagram up here. Um, so once we reach the, in this case, minus 60, I said minus 90, uh, some of the, depending on which part of the heart, is gonna have slightly different uh, resting membrane potentials. Um, but once we get to the resting membrane potential, these funny sodium channels begin to open and they're going to slowly let sodium leak into the cell. And that is going to raise the resting membrane potential back up to threshold at a specific rate cause depolarization, repolarization, funny, funny sodium channels open. And so basically we'll have a sustained repeating uh, action potential here. And so this is why these are self-depolarizing uh, pacemaker cells. Okay, so that's the uh, two major types of action potentials. Fast response found in contractile cells. They use sodium to depolarize. And then the slow response action potentials using uh, calcium to depolarize. As we'll see, calcium channel blockers will also work to slow the electrical impulses down in the conducting uh, system. And so they're gonna be important medications for specific types of cardiac arrhythmias. So just to summarize some of the concepts we just went over, um, the myocytes and the SA node, AV node, bundle of His, and Purkinje system all have the capacity to act as pacemakers of the heart. Um, each has, though, its own intrinsic firing rate, its own automaticity. So we can say the concentration of flooding sodium channels is different in the different parts of the conducting system, which gives them their own unique rate. So the SA node, again, unique rate of 60 to 100 beats per minute. AV node uh, and the proximal bundle of His, 40 to 60 beats per minute. And then Purkinje system, anywhere between 20 and 40 beats per minute. Um, the myocytes with the fastest intrinsic firing rates, so in, this, in a normal heart, the SA node, uh, are the native pacemakers, and they overdrive suppress all of the other latent pacemakers. So that uh, capacity to over to entrain, but they, all of the other cells entrain to the fastest signal. That's called overdrive, overdrive suppression. Um, if the SA node again fails to fire, the next fastest pacemaker takes over, typically the AV node, and so on. So you could say the heart has sort of built-in safety mechanisms, but by the time we get to the pacemakers in the Purkinje system, or even the ventricular myocardium, it's so slow that uh, it's probably not gonna maintain normal cardiac output. It might be able to keep a person alive, but um, they won't be able to really move or do much. Um, now, that's the, the sort of native rate. Now, the autonomic nervous system, as we'll see, remember we have the sympathetic nervous system, which comes in, and the parasympathetic nervous system. Sympathetic secretes norepinephrine, and that's going to bind to beta-2 receptors, and then the parasympathetic nervous system from the vagus nerve secretes acetylcholine, and that binds to muscarinic receptors. Um, basically, the sympathetics will speed up the SA node, and that can bring it above its natural firing rate of 100 beats per minute, even faster, versus the parasympathetics will slow it down. So our autonomic nervous system is constantly speeding up or slowing down the heart. Uh, in fact, every time you take a breath in, your sympathetics fire a little bit faster, and so your heart rate speeds up just a little bit. And then as, as you exhale, your parasympathetics kick in and uh, your heart slows down just a little bit. 
And that is actually a normal finding. In fact, some uh, younger patients, uh, athletes, things like that might really notice that difference. That's called a sinus arrhythmia. So basically that's uh, affecting the SA node and it has to do with the sympathetics and parasympathetic firing rates on that node. Um, now, different uh, hormones also will affect this, and then different medications and drugs like caffeine and whatnot will affect this. So I'll go through the whole list here in a little bit. Uh, but essentially, we can get two potential problems here. One would be an abnormally slow heart rhythm, and that would be bradycardia, which is defined as any uh, heart rhythm uh, uh, less than 60 beats per minute. Um, and that uh, typically is asymptomatic um, until it falls below 50 beats per minute. Uh, and that's when we start seeing symptoms like fatigue and dizziness and possible syncope or fainting. Um, usually uh, the rate falls during sleep because the parasympathetics kick on during sleep and the sympathetics turn off during sleep. Um, athletes as well have uh, usually a slower resting heart rate, so they can be below 60. Um, but basically we wanna always clinically investigate any heart rhythm below 60. Uh, we might find the patient has no symptoms. There may be an athlete, you know, that, that trains five times a week and, and so forth. And we're not, we don't really need to worry about that. But in others, especially elderly patients, we might want to look at, is there a problem in the conduction system? And this would require an EKG to diagnose. So that's when we'd refer, or if we do EKGs in the office, do it there. Um, and that could be anything from a sinus bradycardia, um, these are all referred to as cardiac bradyarrhythmias. Uh, so sinus bradycardia, the SA node fires less than 60 beats per minute. And that can be indicative of something called sick sinus syndrome, where there's been damage to the myocytes inside the SA node. They're just not firing at their intrinsic rhythm anymore. Could be a block, for example, in the AV node or in the bundle of hiss or the bundle branches, or it could be arising from the ventricular system. So we can use the EKG to help us differentiate all that. Um, the opposite would be a rapid heart rate of over 100 beats per minute in adults, and that would be a tachyarrhythmia. Uh, many causes of this. And uh, typically it involves activation of the sympathetic uh, nervous system. Uh, and this could be associated with cardiac tachyarrhythmias. And again, we need an EKG to diagnose uh, the different types. So we can have a sinus tachycardia. The SA node just fires on its own too quickly. We can have what are called supraventricular above the ventricles tachycardia. And that could include things like atrial flutter. We'll go through all these in the uh, arrhythmia section. Atrial fibrillation. AV nodal reentrant tachycardia and AV nodal reentrant tachycardia. Uh, and then uh, junctional tachycardia and ventricular tachycardia. So many, many different types of tachyarrhythmias. Now, one final little concept here. This will be important in the future. Uh, there are medications that can interfere with the conduction, with the pacemakers, and the conducting system in the heart, and these are the antiarrhythmic drugs. And there are four classes. They each target different uh, features of the conducting system. Class one uh, antiarrhythmics are sodium channel blockers. And I'll give you some examples like lidocaine, procanamide, those kind of drugs later. Um, they block the sodium channel, so they're going to prevent depolarization. And that's going to effectively slow the, um, the conduction, the heart rhythm. Um, class two drugs would be beta blockers. And that'll be a major class we'll look at. Beta blockers will block the beta-2 receptors um, on the heart muscle, and uh, they will prevent norepinephrine from stimulating them. Class 3 would be potassium uh, channel blockers, and then class 4 would be calcium channel blockers, another major group of cardiovascular medications. So very commonly in cardiovascular practices and for uh, managing cardiac patient, cardiovascular patients in uh, biomedicine, Class two and class four drugs are very commonly used. Class one, class three have a lot more side effects and uh, they're used in special circumstances, but not as commonly as class two and class four. Generally, the class two and class four are targeting the pacemaker cells and the class one and three are targeting the myocytes. Um, so that's a little bit of an introduction there to uh, arrhythmias, but we're gonna look at that in more detail in the pathology section. Now the autonomic nervous system, as I said, can regulate both the heart rate, but also the force of cardiac muscle contraction. So that's very important uh, to know. So control of heart rate is known as a chronotropic effect, uh, and that involves both the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems. 
The, again, average resting adult heart rate is between 60 and 100 beats per minute. Um, exercise, fitness levels, your basal metabolic rate, um, any sort of scarring in the heart muscle from previous MIs or heart failure or cardiomyopathy will all affect that. Um, the second aspect would be the force, the so-called contractility of the heart, and that's mediated by how the ions, sodium, potassium, are able to flow, uh, and these are known as ionotropic effects. So when we hear the word chronotropic, that relates to heart rate. Ionotropic will relate to contractility. Um, this is basically regulated primarily by your sympathetic nervous system, not your parasympathetics. Um, Okay, and I already talked about how the sympathetics and parasympathetics really come into the so-called cardiac plexus. So there's this nervous system both inside the heart. Again, that's different than the myocytes. So the heart has intrinsic neurons. But then we have extrinsic neurons that concentrate in the plexus, almost like a brain around the heart, the cardiac plexus. And that has both sympathetic and parasympathetic fibers. Um, other factors, different hormones, electrolytes, body temperature, hypoxia, pH, all will also affect both the chronotropic and ionotropic activity. So basically, sympathetic stimulation, um, these nerves all originate from the sympathetic ganglia um, and uh, from both the cervical ganglia and the superior thoracic ganglia between T1 and T4. Now, in uh, Chinese medicine circles, um, the latter shoe points, interestingly, are along those same pathways. So one theory is by needling the different shoe points, you're actually increasing the sympathetic outflow uh, into the target organ. Um, the fibers innervate the SA and the AV nodes, as well as the muscle fibers in the atria and the ventricles. So the sympathetics kind of go everywhere in the heart. Uh, and the ventricles are very richly innervated. Uh, the sympathetic nerves secrete norepinephrine. Now, again, the adrenal medulla secretes epinephrine, which is going to be a hormone in the blood, but they both have very similar actions. They both bind to beta-1 receptors. Um, I think I might have said beta-2 in the last video, that last slide. That should have been beta-1. Beta-2s are found in the lungs. Um, but norepi and epi bind to beta-1 receptors, and that is going to do several things. One, it's going to decrease the repolarization period, so you're going to have more uh, fast repolarizations. It's going to increase the rate of depolarization and contraction, and it's going to increase the strength of contractions of the cardiac muscle. Um, it's also going to increase the rate and magnitude of influx of calcium ions, increase the rate and magnitude of calcium release from that sarcoplasmic reticulum, and then increase the rate of the pump. Uh, I didn't mention that, but after the calcium is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, uh, it causes the actin and myosin to contract. Well, then the cell has to get rid of that calcium, has to pump it back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum for storage. And so there's a pump that takes it back up and recycles it. Uh, in fact, in skeletal muscle, we think the reason we get muscle fatigue is not from the uh, buildup of lactic acid, it's actually due to a decrease of the activity of that calcium pump that takes up the calcium from the cytoplasm and puts it back into the storage, into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Well, same kind of pump exists in the heart, and uh, the action of the beta-1 receptors is to increase the activity of that pump. Parasympathetics uh, kind of work the opposite. They are going to, uh, these all come from the vagus nerve, they're going to decrease the rate of the SA node depolarization and, um, and in fact, they're gonna be most predominant at rest. When you're resting, your heart's gonna get mostly vagal input. So this picture to the right just kind of shows you the uh, sort of normal resting uh, pacemaker potential. Here is the effect of parasympathetic stimulation. It slows it down, it prolongs each of the uh, pacemaker potentials. And here's the effects of the sympathetics. So you get very short pacemaker potentials and they occur very quickly, one right on the back of the other. Uh, so the autonomic uh, nervous system really is regulating all this. Um, now, the autonomic system is integrating information from the whole body. In fact, the brainstem is receiving inputs from what are called proprioceptors, baroreceptors, and chemoreceptors. Baroreceptors sense pressure, and they're found in the, I'll go over those later, uh, but they're found, for example, in different arteries, in the aortic arch, and the carotid arteries. Chemoreceptors are sensing the amount of oxygen, uh, acid, and whatnot that's building up in the blood. And then proprioceptors are motion 
uh, receptors. But all these are going to be integrated into um, the cardiovascular regulatory center in the brainstem. And uh, that will then affect the sympathetic and parasympathetic outflow to the heart. So the brain and the heart are communicating in this very integrated way. Um, okay, so that's the sympathetic and parasympathetic innervation of the heart and, and their uh, effects. So here I want to just quickly review some of the factors that influence heart rate and contraction. Uh, again, chronotropic means an increase in heart rate, uh, or positive, we say a, a positive chronotropic would be an increase in heart rate. Negative chronotropic would be a decrease in heart rate. And then a positive inotropic would mean uh, there's increased strength of contractions. A negative inotropic would be a decrease uh, strength of contractions. So we're going to have, we could have positive and negative on either one of those. The parasympathetic nervous system essentially is going to decrease heart rate. Um, so it's going to have a negative chronotropic effect. And the sympathetic is going to increase heart rates, positive chronotropic, and it's going to increase contractions, positive inotropic effect. And that's mediated by norepi and epi, as mentioned before. Those are, again, called catecholamines. Um, chemoreceptors. Um, so, for example, any cardiac ischemia, so less oxygen flowing into the heart muscle uh, with acidosis, um, buildup of uh, hydrogen ions, uh, protons, um, that's going to trigger an increase of heart rate and strength of contraction. And then alkalosis increase of hydroxyl ions, more, uh, more basic pH, will cause a decrease in heart rate and contraction. Uh, in terms of action on proprioceptors, exercise will increase heart rate and contraction. After exercise, it will decrease. Uh, all this makes sense, but this is kind of showing you how all this is integrated together. Baroreceptors, which are pressure receptors. Uh, so basically, if blood pressure falls, if there's less pressure inside the blood vessels, so these are located in different arteries. Um, as the pressure goes down inside the artery, the uh, baroreceptor fires less frequently, and uh, so there'll be a decreased rate of firing. But then the, uh, that'll be integrated in the brainstem, and then the brainstem will activate your sympathetic nervous system to increase the heart rate and contraction, because the one reason for the falling pressure could be you're hemorrhaging or something, you're not gonna maintain your perfusion. And so the heart speeds up its activity to try to increase perfusion. Uh, thyroid hormones generally increase heart rate and contraction. So that's why in hyperthyroidism, people get contractile uh, or uh, rapid heart rate. Um, they can actually, can actually trigger different cardiac arrhythmias like atrial fibrillation and whatnot. Calcium states of high calcium, this would be in the plasma, so that's called hypercalcemia. So again, this is the, your blood levels of calcium. If those go up, uh, that generally increases heart rate and contraction. In fact, in severe hypercalcemia, that could uh, hypercalcemia, that can result in cardiac arrest. Uh, low calcium, hypocalcemia, would decrease heart rate and contraction. Uh, sodium hypernatremia is going to increase heart rate and contraction. In fact, it can uh, uh, change the uh, uh, action potential and it can change the electrical activity in the heart and that can cause a very severe arrhythmia we'll talk about later. Um, and then hyponatremia um, that, uh, can that will decrease heart rate and contraction usually. Potassium hyperkalemia will have the opposite effect. It'll decrease the heart rate. Hypokalemia heart rate goes up um, and that can also predispose to a dangerous arrhythmia. Nicotine and caffeine all increase heart rate and contractions, and then bo increased body temperature will increase heart rate and contractions. Uh, and that's basically to get more perfusion into the organs that will allow your peripheral blood vessels to vasodilate and then ventilate off more heat. So that's one way of, uh, that we thermoregulate. So it gives you some idea of how all these mechanisms are integrated. Now, one interesting tool we can use to um, actually measure the autonomic tone or the amount of sympathetic versus parasympathetic stimulation we have on the heart is something called heart rate variability. So it's very interesting that um, if you look at uh, the average person's heartbeat, um, and this is looking at what's uh, the signal from the EKG, which we'll look at here shortly, but uh, basically from this peak to this peak is one heartbeat. Um, if you measure each heartbeat and the distance between the beats, it's actually in a healthy person not the same over time. There's variability there. So it's very small. So we have, for example, this this first one is 0.859 seconds. 
This next one is 0 0.793 seconds. The next one is 0 0.726 seconds. So that's very subtle changes. But this variability um, is very important. In fact, um, that's indicating that the autonomic system is constantly trying to adjust the heart rate to meet the body's demands and so forth. Um, so there's a variability there. Um, generally, a good HRV, heart rate variability, is a sign of physiologic health. Uh, and when we see a decreased variability, in other words, when your heart starts to beat like a metronome, when there's no variability, we find that's associated with increased cardiovascular disease and general illness in the body. So we actually need that uh, variability for physiologic health. Uh, we generally use the EKG to measure this, um, and these peaks on the EKG are called the R, R intervals. Um, so that's basically just looking from one heartbeat to the next. Um, we can also use a pulse ox meter, uh, and that can uh, detect your heart rate, as well, heart rate as well. So a lot of the heart rate variability devices actually just use the clip-on finger device, and that can measure your heartbeat as well. Um, there's various methods that the data can be analyzed. There's what's called time domain and frequency analysis. I'll talk about that here in just a second. I won't go into all those details here. But basically, physiologically, um, heart rate variability tells us about the autonomic influences on the heart. So when the parasympathetic nervous system is activated, um, uh, we see what's called high frequency activity uh, between 0.15 and uh, 0.4 hertz cycles per second. So that's called a high frequency effect versus when the sympathetic nervous system is activated, we get a low frequency activity generally. Um, and so when we have decreased parasympathetic tone or increased sympathetic tone, we get a decreased heart rate variability in general. So we kind of want those high frequency changes. Uh, and again, I'm not going to go into what that means in terms of analysis, but that's one way we can analyze the beat to beat variability is through frequency domain analysis. Um, now, in addition to the autonomics, we know the different hormones playing on this. So some people are looking at how thyroid hormones, cortisol, insulin all affect your heart rate variability, which I think would yield some very interesting data on your whole neuroendocrine system and essentially using the heartbeat to diagnose how your whole neuroendocrine system is functioning. Um, there are several committees that have been set up to kind of standardize because there's all these different heart rate variability devices on the market and uh, some committees have been set up to standardize values. So for example, the task force of the European Society of Cardiology and the Heart Rhythm Society have kind of given guidelines in terms of what is an adequate device and so forth. Um, so heart rate variability really is in a way we can actually analyze in a person whether their sympathetic fight or flight system is overwhelming their parasympathetic system. Now, normally we'd say, well, that's easy to tell, person's stressed out and whatnot. Their sympathetics are probably active, but I've had many people who on the surface appear very calm. Um, I've used this technique in my earlier practice and uh, very calm. And then I would, we would look at their heart rate variability and they're clearly in sympathetic stress. Uh, they're just able to internalize it and hold it. So I, I found it provided useful feedback for patients to show them like, well, you know, this is interesting. You are calm on the surface, but you're actually, your physiology is in quite a stress state. And that's putting more stress on the heart. That's putting stress on your uh, blood vessels, increasing hypertension, all that sort of thing. Um, again, going back to acupuncture, we think that one of the main effects of acupuncture is to essentially improve the parasympathetic tone in the body. So we can uh, help balance that out. And I know some acupuncturists who use heart rate variability meters and devices and software to kind of look at before and after effects from acupuncture. Generally though, most people will know when they feel relaxed, uh, especially after an acupuncture treatment. Now there's an interesting uh, center, it's called the Heart Math Institute. It's founded by a medical doctor uh, in, in the early 90s. It's a nonprofit institute. They kind of are uh, in they, their, their, their sort of mission statement is to help people bring their physical, mental, emotional systems into a balanced alignment with their heart's intuitive guidance. Um, and they've looked at this notion of heart coherence as measured by heart rate variability. So if you look at this picture down here, um, this let's look at the stress diagram first. Um, this is the time in seconds. And this is your heart rate. So this is looking at the beat-to-beat -beat variability over time in a person. So 
you know, we see at one moment it was, you know, 60 beats per minute, another 70 beats per minute, and so forth, up and down. And you can kind of plot that on the graph over time. And this particular person was stressed. I think they were given a task that was very stressful to do, like counting backwards from, you know, 100 by 7 or something like that, or back, backwards by 6.5 or something that's difficult, and you're put on the spot to do it. You secrete a lot of stress hormones, and this is what their heart rate variability plot looked like over time. Then they had a person get really relaxed. They went into a nice deep breathing rhythm. They thought about some happy thoughts. And um, this is what their heart rate variability looked like. Um, so they are using heart rate variability to kind of gauge a person's inner emotional state. And uh, what we find in the more what, we, what they call coherent emotional states like happiness and love and so forth is you get these really interesting sinusoidal patterns. This is really a sinus arrhythmia kind of varying with your uh, breath. So we could say the heart and the breathing rhythm are synchronized in this case, whereas in the stress state, they're clearly desynchronized. So I present all this as maybe another tool to kind of investigate the different rhythms in the body, in this case, the autonomic rhythms. What's very interesting, they've also gone further and now they're doing a lot of work on this idea that if you look at any changing electrical current in time, so for example, the heart's electrical current, as the ion flows go through the heart, causing cardiac muscle contraction, it's changing in time. Well, any changing flow of electrons is going to have an associated magnetic field. And they've actually found that the magnetic field of the heart actually extends uh, several feet around a person's body, and it forms a toroid uh, in shape. So that's what this picture is. So that's the electromagnetic field of the heart. Um, now, they found that this field will interact with other people's fields, and your one person's heart rhythm and another person's heart rhythm can actually synchronize. Um, and so that's uh, this interesting idea when we're in sync with someone, not just on a figurative sense, but physiologically our heart rates are actually entrained and the heart rate variability becomes entrained. They've gone further and shown that the EEG, which is a measure of your brainwave activity, uh, will often in those happy coherent states will synchronize. So the brain and the EKG, the EEG and the EKG will synchronize and, in a person. And similarly, two people who are entrained together, their EEGs will also synchronize. So this is very interesting looking at the electromagnetic connections between people. Before I move on, I'll just say, you know, in uh, traditional medicines, we talk about subtle energies, chi and whatnot. Uh, there's some debate as to whether or not chi and those subtle energies are actually electromagnetic because electromagnetic phenomena dissipate with distance. You can also shield them, uh, like with a so-called Faraday cage, put a person inside there and that will block all the electromagnetic signals from coming in or out. Um, but we know that healers who are reportedly using chi and whatnot to heal can still heal when they're inside a Faraday cage. They can heal someone from a distance. And that would not be consistent with electromagnetism, uh, but it might indicate there are different forces we don't yet understand, maybe some sort of quantum forces that are connected non-locally. Uh, they're really part of a universal field that we can tap into. So that's going to be different from this, uh, but this might be indicating you know, the beginnings of that kind of research. So HeartMath Institute might be something to look into if you're interested in looking at how the heart rhythms uh, integrate the rest of our physiology. So the final concept I'll leave this video off on is the electrocardiogram. And this is a way of measuring the electrical conduction through the heart. What's amazing about the electrical signal in the heart is that it can be detected anywhere in the body. So every cell is essentially being exposed to the electrical activity of the heart. Um, so this was in the uh, uh, late 18, early 1900s. It was found that putting electrodes on the skin uh, would actually be able to detect a uh, current uh, that was related to the heartbeat. And uh, this is the electrocardiogram. Um, in German, car cardio is with a K. Uh, so the original acronym was EKG, and we still use that, but the technical term here in the US would be uh, ECG. So ECG, EKG are interchangeable. Um, we use surface electrodes, so they don't penetrate the skin, and they're placed on different parts of the body. I'll show those here in just a moment. Um, and if we look at the electrical signal of the heart, get a reading over time, so that's the picture down here. We see 
this kind of reading over time. Each of these uh, complexes is one heartbeat. Um, and you see there's different waves associated with each heartbeat. And the waves will depend on where the electrodes are located, but basically uh, the typical wave complex looks like this. With each heartbeat, we get what's called a P wave. Uh, and then sh a short time after, we get uh, a big spike like this. Uh, and then it goes back to baseline and we get a second little wave after that. Uh, we label the first wave the P wave. We label the big spike the QRS complex. And then the last little wave we labeled the T wave. Uh, and then there are different intervals. The beginning of the P wave to the beginning of the QRS complex is called the PR interval. Um, and then we have uh, a little segment here called the PR segment. And that's going to be at the end of the P wave before the uh, QRS complex. Then we have the QRS complex itself. Um, then from the beginning of the Q wave to the end of the T wave is the QT interval. And then between the end of the S wave and the beginning of the T wave is the ST segment. Now, that's a lot to know, but basically all of these have normal ranges for time. And any deviation from that is going to indicate different pathologies. And this is something we can pick up with the EKG. And so this is going to be our main tool for diagnosing the electrical system of the heart. So P wave, what it actually represents is the depolarization of the atria. So when the P wave is occurring, your atria are contracting. When the QRS uh, complex occurs, this is when the ventricles contract. So notice that should be a very short interval, but that signal is basically the spreading of the electrical signal down the interventricular septum uh, to the apex of the heart and then up through the Purkinje fibers uh, causing ventricular contraction. And then the T wave represents the repolarization of the ventricles. Now there is actually a wave that represents the repolarization of the atria, but it's buried in the QRS wave, so we normally don't see it on the ECG. Um, and then we have the different intervals, uh, and again, those can be indicative of different problems in the conducting system. Okay, so that's the typical uh, sort of ECG tracing. Now we can use an ECG to essentially measure different things. Um, so we can look at uh, should actually be not six, but five. Uh, the rate of the heart, the heart rate, which we can measure without an EKG, but um, we can use this uh, interval between the R and the R uh, uh, peaks. We can, that's one, uh, that would be one heartbeat, and we can measure the rate very accurately. Uh, we can look at the rhythm of the heart, whether or not we're having normal P waves, whether or not the QRS complex is uh, kind of nice and tight, or if it's more prolonged, etc. Uh, we can look at the axis of the heart. So normally in a person, the heart is sitting at a bit of an angle. So it's not pointing downward. It's actually pointing a little bit of an angle to the left. In fact, anywhere between perfectly vertical and about horizontal, anywhere in here is going to be a normal axis. So people that are very thin actually have a, a heart that's more pointed downward. People that have more abdominal um, obesity are gonna have a heart that's more pointed to the right. Um, and anything in between is usually normal. When we start seeing a heart axis go up this way or this way, that's gonna indicate different pathologies. For example, a very enlarged heart and so forth. So that would be another measure we can do from the EKG, ECG. We can uh, detect from the EC ECG if there's any enlargement of the ventricles and that would be cardiac hypertrophy. So any uh, enlargement that way. And then finally, we can see if there's any part of the heart muscle that's undergoing infarction. In other words, parts of the heart muscle that are dying. What, what can happen in those cases is we get a weird thing where the uh, ST segment actually elevates. And so, so we see this elevated uh, peak on the ECG. And so that would be a fifth thing we can uh, measure with the ECG. So it can be very useful for diagnosing a number of cardiac arrhythmias, myocardial infarction, uh, and so forth. Now there's different types of ECGs. Um, you can use your iPhone now um, essentially uh, to do a what's called a single line ECG. So that'll just give you, you know, a single uh, what we call rhythm strip, and that will essentially give you the P wave and QRS complex, the intervals, and so forth. But to and that can tell you a lot about the heart rate and the heart rhythm. Uh, 
but to get the information about the axis, the hypertrophy, infarction, we need to actually do what's called a 12-lead ECG. And that is a standard way of uh, putting different electrodes on the body. So this is the typical readout of a 12-lead ECG. And just to kind of let you know what we're seeing here is um, here we see these numbers. So one, two, three, those are Roman numerals. Uh, we see something called AVR over here, AVL, uh, AVF. And then we see V1, V2, V3, uh, V4, V5, V6. Now, going back to one, everything between one and then this symbol for AVR, this is obtained from uh, basically two leads in the body. There always has to be a negative lead and a positive lead. Um, so that's going to be one rhythm that we see right here. This will be obtained from another set of leads. This is obtained from a third set of leads, and you get the idea. So basically, we get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 uh, different readings on the body. And that's what we call a 12-lead ECG. And then typically on a 12-lead ECG tracing, you'll see at the bottom, lead number 2 uh, is just left to run the entire time. So that gives you, over time, a better view of the rhythm of the heart. So that's, uh, if you see this kind of paper with the ECG, that's what you're looking at. Now, what are all these different leads? Well, here are um, the different placement of the leads on the body. So the easiest diagram, I think, will be down here. Uh, we form what's called Einthoven's Triangle. Einthoven was one of the early ECG pioneers. Um, one lead is placed on the right arm, one is on the left arm, one is on the left leg. So basically, lead one is looking at the vector between the right arm and the left arm. So the electrical signal, again, is going to start in the SA node, going to pass down the atria into the AV node, then down the ventricles, and then back up again. So in lead one, we're going to see essentially all the electrical activity that's mapping this way. Lead two, it's actually going to follow really the axis of the heart. It's between the right arm and the left leg. It's going to follow this vector, which is really the vector of the kind of normal heart rhythm. So when we look at that ECG tracing I showed you in the last slide with the P wave, QRS, and whatnot, that's typically what we see at lead two. Um, and then lead three would be a vector from your left arm to the right leg. So it's looking at the vector this way. So by placing these different leads, we get three different vectors um, that we can look at. Now we go further, we can take the average of these leads and get further vectors. So we get AVR, AVL, and AVF. So AVF is a vector looking straight downward. AVL is a vector looking this way. AVR is a vector looking this way. So essentially what that does is it divides the heart rhythm up into a circle of axes. So we're getting basically um, a reading at each one of these points of the heart rhythm. And again, we're not going to go into an ECG interpretation in this video, uh, but you're able to, from that data, put together a lot of information about the rhythm of the heart, about, again, the access, hypertrophy, and the infarction. Now, we go even further. Um, we, that actually gives you six readings. Um, we go further, and we put actually six chest leads on as well. So one to the right of the sternum, one just to the left, and then... Uh, the sixth one is actually put at the side of the chest, and the other three fill in here. And what that's going to do is give you an axis that is not so... If you look at Einthoven's triangle, that's giving you an axis that's flat on the body, basically. And this axis is going to give you a transverse axis. So by, the, by doing this, we actually get a three-dimensional view of the electrical signal passing through the heart. And again, I'm not going to go into interpretation, but basically the readings from all these different uh, pairings of electrodes are what we see in the 12 lead ECG. So we're actually not using 12 leads. We use six chest leads and then generally uh, three leads for the front of the body. So it's actually just nine leads. Um, and typically we don't put them on the arms. We put the leads, uh, these, the right arm lead and left arm lead at the corners of the chest up here. And then we often put the left leg lead down here. So we tape all these electrodes onto the chest at those different positions. And again, we're going to give us all that information that I just talked about. So that's the very basics of the electrocardiogram. Uh, we're not going to go into interpretation, but we'll I'll talk a bit about some of the ECG findings that are characteristic of different cardiac diseases as we go.
All right, so that wraps it up for the first video here on cardiac physiology, really looking uh, more closely at depth at the uh, cardiac uh, electrical activity.